I'm Dan Crane, a professor in the biology department at Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio, and this is a video in a series of videos about forensic DNA profiling. Uh, you can find the PowerPoint presentation as well as a, a, an abundance of associated reading materials uh, at a website, bioforensics.com. But with that out of the way, let's just get to work. In this particular video, I want to talk with you about uh, what could possibly go wrong with forensic DNA profiling tests. Uh, so much of the popular media makes us think that uh, DNA tests are absolutely infallible and you know, it's lock solid uh, types of conclusions and evidence the associated with DNA test results. And there is no denying that DNA testing is the gold standard of forensic science. It's the uh, type of forensic test that all the other forensic tests look up to and aspire to be like. Uh, in the best case scenarios, DNA tests can give astronomical weights to minuscule amounts of biological evidence associated with crimes and can be a very helpful, very powerful tool for criminal justice in general. But there are times that we know over the past 10 to 20 years where DNA testing has given rise to results that uh, haven't been quite up to snuff. And there are lessons to be learned from looking at those types of problems um, that may help in all types of DNA tests. So I'm not the first person to have had that idea that there may be some lessons that could be learned from looking at problems associated with DNA test results. And I'll sum up for you here with the uh, words on this particular slide what it is that may actually uh, give rise to the biggest problems. Um, there's so much about DNA testing that is very sound, reliable, impressive science. But the problems that arise with DNA tests invariably seem to be gravitating to, to be falling into the category of what passes as science but isn't very scientific within the realm of DNA profiling. And those problems are most likely to come into play in a certain set of circumstances, when the samples that are being analyzed have small amounts of DNA, when the material that you're starting with is a mixture of more than one individual, or when analysts need to use their judgment to resolve ambiguities. In those circumstances, when any one of those three or a combination of those three things are in play, those seem to be where it is we encounter problems with DNA profiling the most. And again, I'm not the first one to have come up with the idea that we might be able to learn some valuable lessons from looking at the uh, instances where problems have been identified. Uh, there's a body known as the DNA Advisory Board. It's a group of individuals that are appointed by the director of the FBI to give guidance and establish policies that crime laboratories around the United States should follow when they're performing forensic DNA profiling. And among the recommendations that the DNA Advisory Board has put forward is this one that's uh, displayed on the screen for you now called Standard 14. And very simply, what Standard 14 says is this, is that when a DNA testing laboratory finds that they've generated a result, and specifically an unexpected result, that they need to document that that unexpected result was generated, investigate why it is that that result was generated, and then also spell out in written form how it is that they're going to change things such that those types of unexpected results, those problems, don't rely again. Uh, I'm sorry, don't occur again. You, you can imagine, this, this makes excellent sense. It's a wonderful quality assurance, quality control type of practice. And again, it's very clearly, very plainly spelled out by the DNA Advisory Board in their Standard 14. Here's the thing. For a testing laboratory within the United States to qualify for federal assistance, to get money to perform some of their work, they need to demonstrate that they adhere to all of the standards of the DNA Advisory Board, including Standard 14. And so what's happened is 
Every laboratory within the country maintains just such a log. When they find a result that's unexpected, they record it, they investigate it, and they describe how it is that they'll avoid having such an unexpected result take place again. And for the attorneys that are watching these videos, I think maybe uh, a red light may be starting to flash uh, in your minds because if there's such a written document, it's discoverable in a legal sense. That means that the attorneys that are involved in litigating cases where DNA tests have been generated can ask for that written document to be provided. Their corrective action logs for the laboratories or their unexpected result logs for the laboratories can be part of the discovery materials that attorneys get to look at as they're preparing their cases. And what I'd like to do over the course of the next half hour or so is talk with you about just what we find in those types of unexpected result logs. Because again, there's a lesson to be learned here about where it is that problems can arise and how it is that laboratories have been learning to avoid having those problems arise in the future. So let's get to work and talk about some of the things that we find in those unexpected results logs. This is a fairly random sampling that I'm going to be presenting to you, but it's intended to give you a, a breadth of experience here in terms of just what sorts of things crime laboratories have found can and do go wrong during the course of forensic DNA testing. So the first in the series pertains to simply cross-contamination. Here's what's taken place here. You can see the laboratory has maintained a log. They've found a result that they didn't expect to see. And the, the result that they've found here is fairly simply this. What they see is that for an individual's, and I'll emphasize there, individual, for an individual's reference sample, that the reference sample for this individual actually seems to be a mixture. It's got a major profile and it's got a minor profile. Of course, a reference sample from an individual should have only a major profile. And so the unexpected result here is that there was somebody else's DNA in this reference profile. Here's what the lab's remedy was when they discovered this. They reamplified the samples, or the sample here, the reference sample, and they found that the problem was resolved, that instead of seeing a mixture of a major contributor and a minor contributor, they now just saw the DNA profile of the major contributor. What happened? Well, as the slide suggests, this is an instance of cross-contamination. Apparently, DNA somehow got transferred from one reference sample into another reference sample during the course of DNA profiling, and that in turn gave rise to this mixture in what should have been a single source sample. All right, so what could go wrong? Well, what could go wrong is contamination can occur. But I wanna make sure that you appreciate what might seem subtle at the beginning here, and that is that this particular instance that we've just talked about in that previous image is an instance of an unexpected result. Laboratories only record and investigate unexpected results. It was unexpected that a reference sample for an individual would look as if it was a mixture. What if instead of having a contamination event for a reference sample though, there was a contamination event with an, for an evidence sample? Stop and think for a moment about those implications. What if the contamination wasn't from one reference sample to another reference sample, but from a reference sample, say the defendant, to an evidence sample? Now we may find an evidence sample that has the defendant's DNA profile within it, that is not necessarily an unexpected result. And yet, if contamination between reference samples can occur, contamination between reference samples and evidence samples at least seems as if it might be in the realm of possibility. From the defense's perspective, a defendant may argue that every time that their DNA profile is found with an evidence sample is best explained by contamination. Um, a prosecutor obviously would, would be inclined to disagree, but the fact that you can have contamination between reference samples takes place makes us at least have to pause and think if maybe there's potential for contamination between evidence samples or possibly between reference samples and evidence samples.
All right, well, let's move on to another example. Here we have another instance where a laboratory has documented that they have a positive result that appears in a negative control. If you've watched the other videos in this series, you'll probably recall that in association with every evidence sample and reference samples, a testing laboratory will generate a series of controls. They'll include a positive control where they'll get a DNA profile uh, from a known source and they'll check to make sure that it got generated the way that they expected it to be generated. They'll also generate a negative control and a reagent blank. Both the negative control and the reagent blank are different types of sentries, but they're looking to see essentially if contamination might have occurred. A negative control and a reagent blank shouldn't have any DNA profile information in it, but here this laboratory has found an unexpected result simply that there is a pronounced DNA profile associated with a negative control. They've further documented what it is that they identified as the reason that that occurred, and it turns out that they feel the, con the, the positive result showed up in a negative control because there was a mix-up, as they say, in where the tubes were located for those two separate samples. A positive control, it seems, and a negative control. Where they got placed in a test tube rack simply got mixed up and confused. Again, this is an unexpected result. The swapping, the, the mix-up of where those tubes showed up in the evidence racks, uh, or, or the, 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 the test tube racks that the laboratory was using, was recognized because the result was unexpected. Think again if maybe this could have happened with an evidence sample and the reference sample from a suspect. If you were to get the DNA profile for a suspect in what you had thought was an evidence sample, many crimes would, would many investigators would end up deciding that was not an unexpected result because uh, that's why the individual, the individual was being investigated. All right, let's move on to a third example. Um, very much like the previous example, this is an instance where a laboratory has recognized that they got a positive result in another negative control, once again due to a tube swap. And what's interesting here, I think, is not so much, we've already established that that type of mix-up of tubes can happen during the analysis, but what I think is particularly interesting is the corrective action that the analyst and that the crime laboratory has recorded to make sure that that type of mix-up doesn't happen again. In the future, what this lab has decided to do to minimize that problem is to consecutively label the tubes. Notice they've emphasized consecutively here. They're going to label the tubes consecutively instead of using randomly chosen numbers, apparently, the way they had in the past, and they're going to check the tubes carefully before putting them in the rack for the instrument that's going to be doing the analyses. I think it might be worth pausing at this point because if you stop and you think about what it is that's transpired here, I think there's something that's potentially fairly humorous, right? Consider what's taken place here. We've got an amazingly powerful methodology that can generate phenomenally powerful statistics, statistical weights associated with unimaginably small amounts of material. We're talking about numbers in the quintillions and dealing with trillionths of a gram of starting material, and yet the whole thing can be laid low simply because the analysts that were performing the test either didn't number the tubes in a way that was easy for them to track or because they didn't carefully check the way they put the tubes into an instrument that was going to do the final step in the analysis. Uh, the essence of humor, I've been told, is this. It's incongruity. The, this phenom in this case, this phenomenal, powerful, rigorous methodology coupled with the, uh, the sort of uh, comical nature of a mistake arising simply because some tubes had been misnumbered or placed haphazardly in a rack. The, the, that juxtaposition of the rigorous, hardcore science and the very simple, natural human error coming together to give rise to these types of unexpected results, I think at some level is humorous. Uh, however, 
From a criminal justice perspective, of course, we need to think about this carefully, that if that type of mistake could be happening to give rise to unexpected results, again, maybe it's happening in some circumstances with evidence samples that give rise to results that aren't necessarily unexpected. All right, let's look at a fourth example. Here we have an instance where the analyst, probably much to their uh, consternation, found that her own DNA profile was showing up in an evidence sample. Most analysts know what their DNA profile is. They've, they've generated it for the purposes of quality control and assurance and just as part of their own training. And you can imagine the analyst here must have been alarmed when she saw in an evidence sample for a serious crime that her own DNA profile was appearing. What's her recourse? Well, that result certainly is unexpected. What's her recourse? Her recourse is to re-perform the experiment, do everything again, um, and see if maybe you got a better result. When that was done, sure enough, the result that came back was expected uh, using the very same protocols that, they had, that, that this analyst had used before. Now when the experiment was repeated, her DNA was no longer associated with the evidence sample and all was right and all was good with the world again, at least from this analyst's perspective. Once again, let me ask you to stop and think about the broader implications of this potential kind of problem. Clearly what's happened here is the analyst had some contamination of her DNA into some of the tubes that were being tested for that particular case. That was unexpected. It gave rise to an unexpected result. But again, let's take a step back and consider what might be going on with an actual investigation. What kind of result would we have found if an evidence sample had been contaminated with a defendant or a suspect's DNA? We probably would have found a result that wasn't nearly so unexpected as finding the analysts, and it may not have been given a second thought, okay? unlike what take, took place with this own analyst when they found their own DNA in the mix. Well, let's go on to still another example. Um, here we have a laboratory that has documented that they've had a sample handling problem. And the essence of the sample handling problem was that uh, DNA was added from one tube into another tube. Okay? Tubes should have had been treated separately, but the analyst recognized by mistake they transferred DNA from one tube into a tube that it shouldn't have been transferred to. It's a sample handling problem. Again, Human error, that's the sort of thing that human beings do, right? That just sort of happens sometimes. But I think it's important here to take a look at what the laboratory's corrective action was for this particular unexpected result. Their corrective action was to do this. In the future, when the lab is doing sample handling steps, they're going to try to minimize interruptions. Signs were made for the analysts to put at the end of their work areas that indicate they cannot be interrupted at the time that the sign is out. And then, just for good measure, phone calls are not going to be answered in the future during any sample handling and transfer steps. Again, remember my own definition of humor from a couple minutes ago, this incongruity? Stop and think for a moment. The instruments the science that's involved here, the test kits that are involved with generating a DNA profile are truly impressive. The instruments cost altogether about $100,000. Yet, the whole thing can be laid low, the results can be made unreliable simply because the laboratory hadn't invested in printing out a simple sign to post at the end of a workbench saying that the analyst shouldn't be disturbed and that they shouldn't answer the telephone during certain critical steps in the analysis. Again, I think at its core, this is really very funny, but it's also very important. There's an important lesson to be learned here, and that lesson is that while the science and the technology associated with DNA testing may be very, very impressive, we need to bear in mind that it's human beings that are behind the wheel and driving this whole system, and it's the human beings that seem to be the most common source of potentially serious problems with the generation of DNA test results. All right, let's move on and talk about another documented error that we find uh, a laboratory has maintained in its corrective actions log. Uh, 
uh, or unexpected results log. Here we have an instance where uh, there has been a sample switch that took place when uh, evidence items got exchanged, right? Let's see exactly what it says. Uh, when the results were compared to the reference sample of the victim in the case, they were found to not match. It was found that that unexpected result occurred because the evidence samples had again had a mix-up of the DNA numbers and the solution was to repeat the process and be more careful, I'm sure, this time that the evidence samples were actually associated with the case in which uh, the individual was a victim for the particular case. All right? So these types of problems happen fairly regularly. Not Certainly not every case, but they're not at all unheard of. Let's move on to one more example of a documented error that a laboratory has recorded. Uh, this is an interesting one in the sense that uh, you can imagine it's unexpected that a suspect would be found to have a DNA profile that didn't match itself. Here we have an instance where we had a defendant or a suspect who was implicated in two crimes for which they ended up generating two different reference samples, one for each crime, and yet uh, the laboratory found that between the two reference samples they seemed to be from different individuals. There was no correspondence between them at all. They weren't off by an allele or two. They were two completely different profiles. The lab recognized this is unusual, certainly unexpected, and investigated to see what might have been the cause of that. And look what they've discovered and their corrective actions that they're going to do to prevent this type of problem from happening in the future. They found that the error was in the labeling of the tubes when they had first come into the laboratory. And the person who's responsible for attaching those labels um, seemed to be defensive when he said that uh, getting the right names on those tubes is something that uh, he wasn't that excited about. He felt that he, didn't, he shouldn't be the one who has to do somebody else's job for them, making sure that the names on the tubes are right, and that the people in the collecting room are always, his word, getting people's names wrong. So he only pays attention to the numbers on the cases and never the names. Um, so. Again, high-tech equipment, uh, fancy kits that have gone through extensive validation steps, and yet at the end of the day, if the individual who's using a pen to put a name on a test tube writes down the wrong name, we may well find that we get unexpected results. Simple human error seems to be the recurring theme here in terms of what can cause DNA tests to go wrong. All right. Well. Let's change gears a little bit, and instead of talking about those documented errors, let me take a little while now to tell you about a case where uh, testing results led to some unexpected findings and ultimately resulted in a fairly lengthy, fairly expensive investigation uh, to figure out what it is that had gone wrong with the test results and how it is to ensure that those types of problems didn't occur again. I want to talk with you now specifically about a case that I alluded to in an earlier video. This is the case of Jaden Lesky. Uh, Jaden Lesky was a toddler uh, who, at the age of four, went missing in Australia. Uh, I'll give you some of the background associated with this particular case. I came to know about it because of my involvement with a coroner's inquest out of the state of Victoria in Australia. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the legal system in Australia, a coroner in Australia is sort of a hybrid between a uh, coroner in our United States sort of parlance and also the attorney general. He's essentially the chief law enforcement officer for the state of Victoria. <coughs> And because of the circumstances associated with this case and the fact that there clearly had been some puzzling DNA test results that were generated, 
the Victoria State Coroner convened an inquest to investigate what had transpired. And so I'll give you the, a summary of the details of the case. They're spelled out for you on this particular slide. But here's what happened uh, in Jaden Lesky's case. At the age of four, he disappeared from his home. Uh, the circumstances truly are bizarre. If you want to learn more about the details of the case, uh, again, a Google search would probably give you all sorts of stories and background information here. The keywords probably to type in would be Jaden Lesky. Uh, I'll tell you when I say bizarre circumstances, that's, there's no hyperbole there. There was an abundance of blood uh, in his home. It wasn't human blood, it was animal blood. There was a boar's head, a severed boar's head in the home. Again, bizarre circumstances under which Jaden actually went missing. But his body was found six months later after he had gone missing and after an extensive search had been made uh, in the entire country of Australia to find him. Uh, and his, when his body was recovered, uh, it had, his clothing was still intact and forensic scientists recognized that on his clothing were what appeared to be blood stains. And those blood stains were then taken and used to generate uh, a DNA profile. The DNA profile itself had a random match probability of 1 in 227 million. If you think the number is a little bit small by modern DNA profiling standards, let me remind you that this is a case that's about 10 years old. And at the time, uh, Australia was only testing at nine loci instead of the 13 that would, would have been tested these days or even more uh, with some of the more current DNA profiling kits. But that Fairly impressive evidence sample, one in 227 million chance that a randomly chosen individual might have the same profile, was found to be a perfect match to a DNA profile of an individual in the Australian National Database. The perfect match was to a woman who was herself the victim of a crime. She had been raped uh, sometime prior and her DNA profile was mistakenly included in the Australian National Database uh, instead of taking the profile from the inside of a condom and entering that in the database as the offender. They entered by mistake the DNA profile from the outside of a condom. Here that was the victim's DNA profile. A fairly simple mistake uh, that, that took place there. But nonetheless, she was found to be a perfect match. But here's the thing, the victim, the rape victim in this particular case, by all accounts, it was all agreed by all parties, could have had nothing to do with the crime of Jaden Lesky's abduction and murder. That was understood from the very start because this rape victim was mentally handicapped. She lived on the opposite side of the country, in this case in Australia, the opposite side of a continent. and. Because of her handicap, she was under 24-hour care, 24-hour supervision. There was simply no way that this woman, this rape victim, could have had anything at all to do with the disappearance and murder of Jaden Lesky. And yet, her DNA profile was found to be associated with what looked like bloodstains on Jaden Lesky's body. How could that be? Again, a fairly impressive DNA profile match. The random match probability was one in 227 million. How could that be? Well, I'll tell you the laboratory's answer to that question. How could that be? Their answer was, they said it was, in their terms, an adventitious match. In our terms, American English perhaps, what they're saying is it was entirely a coincidence. And the laboratory actually went so far as to provide as part of their answer that it was an adventitious match. They went so far as to say that, and we should all breathe a sigh of relief because they knew that such an adventitious match was bound to happen eventually. And now that they had found it, uh, they could rest at ease that it was unlikely that a similar adventitious or coincidental match would be occurring anytime soon. Again, I think a very self-serving statement, and I think fairly obviously uh, there are some problems with that type of reasoning. But the coroner in Victoria, to his credit, uh, recognized that this was uh, 
not just a self-serving answer, the fact that it was a coincidental match, but also one that seemed like it would be fairly unlikely. The chances apparently are about 1 in 227 million that it would be a coincidence. And so that inspired him to convene an inquest, a formal investigation to explore could, was this really a coincidental match? And he assembled a, a fairly large number of individuals to give him guidance to help him perform an investigation and look into uh, whether or not this was in fact a coincidental match. And I was one of the people that was involved with that particular inquest. And one of the first things that I asked to do when I got involved was to find out when it is that the rape victim's DNA had been processed relative to the evidence samples from uh, little Jaden Lesky. And I found the answer was something that uh, caused me to think I knew what had actually transpired. Uh, the answer was that the rape victim's case had been processed in the same laboratory by the same analysts within a matter of a day or two and prior to the handling of the evidence samples that came from little Jaden Lesky. Right? I've suggested already that made me have a pretty good feel for what it is that had happened here. I, at that point, didn't think that it was a coincidence. Instead, I thought that what we were seeing here was an instance of contamination, cross-contamination between DNA that was collected for one case and DNA that was analyzed in a separate case by the same analyst in the same lab within a relatively short time frame. And so at that point in the in inquest, in the investigation, I thought that I had the answer. This was not a coincidence. This was another example of contamination, much like the other ones that we've talked about earlier in this video. But the laboratory wasn't convinced. They still asserted that it was a coincidence. It was now a bigger coincidence. It wasn't just a one in 227 million random match probability coincidence. It was now a coincidence that was compounded by the fact that the two samples from the two cases just happened to have been analyzed in the same place by the same analyst within a couple of days. So, what does the investigation do at that point? Well, I suggested that we uh, have them look at a few other things, right? If that's not enough to settle the matter of it being contamination, let's test additional loci. DNA was still available for both the rape victim and from little Jaden Lesky's testing. And so the victim Victoria State Lab at that time had only looked at information at nine polymorphic loci. There were other loci that could be looked at. And more tests were performed that found additional matches between the rape victim and Jaden Lesky's profile, uh, or better, Jaden Lesky's evidence profile, uh, at an additional five to seven loci, depending on where you drew the line and said you were convinced with the results or not. Now, instead of a 1 in 227 million kind of coincidental match, now we were talking about, about a 14 or a 16 locus match. And here the statistics uh, get to be back into the quintillions and quadrillions the way we nowadays expect test results to be. And yet, the rape victim continued to be a perfect match. Is it a coincidence? Well, if it is, it's now seeming to be an extremely unlikely coincidence. But I think you probably won't be surprised to hear that the laboratory still maintained it was a coincidence. The fact that there was a random match probability that was now truly astronomical, the fact that um, the uh, samples were handled in close proximity in terms of time and place, more coincidence. We then looked closer at the test results from the original testing and found that some spots where we were unsure what the test results were now even further suggested that the rape victim's DNA was present. And yet the lab still maintained it was a coincidence. There was one last thing that seemed to finally settle the issue. And that was this. The testing laboratory said that it was coincidence because they felt that the rape victim's evidence sample was not degraded, but that Jaden Lesky's evidence sample was degraded. 
let's talk for a minute or two about what I mean by degradation. This is something that, occ that occurs fairly commonly with DNA profile test results. Uh, DNA is a chemical, and like any other chemical, can have bad interactions with other chemicals where the DNA comes out worse for wear. When that happens, a fairly common effect is seen on electropherograms. The smaller peaks, the smaller fragments of DNA on the left-hand side of the electropherogram get less damaged than the bigger pieces of DNA on the right side of the electropherogram. If you stop and think about it, it's simply a matter of target size and target opportunity. A small bit of DNA represents a smaller target where damage might have occurred relative to a larger bit of DNA. And so, with degradation, we'll see tall peaks on the left side of an electropherogram that correspond to the smaller bits of DNA, and smaller peaks on the right side of the electropherogram that correspond to larger bits of DNA. And there's this, what's often referred to as a ski slope, that manifests itself as you look at the height of the peaks moving from left to right. So, again, the testing laboratory here is still maintaining that it's a coincidence, and the final straw for them is they were saying that the rape victim's sample was not degraded, yet the evidence sample from Jaden Lesky was. I don't quite follow that reasoning personally, but nonetheless, to explore it, we've, we did this additional analysis. We looked to see what undegraded samples look like in terms of the heights of the peaks moving from left to right across electropherograms. And I mentioned a little bit ago in this video that there are three controls that are performed in association with any DNA test. One of those is a positive control. The positive control, by anybody's reckoning, should be undegraded. That DNA that comes in the positive control with the test kit should be good, clean, solid, unmixed, uncompromised DNA. And yet what we found when we looked at positive controls is that they too had a little bit of a ski slope associated with them. And you can see the statistics here if you want to look at this very carefully, the slopes of the lines for this blue set of electropherograms had an average of minus 3.8, a downward slope, a slight downward slope on average. There was a little bit less of a downward slope for the green peaks, and from a population of about 100 positive controls, there was also a little bit of a negative slope associated with the heights of the peaks for the yellow electropherograms. So even undegraded, uninhibited DNA shows some evidence of that type of ski slope. But let me now show you the evidence sample that was associated with Jaden Lesky's clothing. Here we see, sure enough, this does look as if it's a degraded sample. It seems especially clear when you look at what's happening in the yellow electropherogram. The peaks on the left side of the electropherogram are much taller than those on the right side of the electropherogram. And we can get the slope. These aren't averages anymore because it's just a single sample. But the slope here is negative 10 for the yellow, negative 7.5 for the green, negative 10 for the blue. And the question then is, if this is in fact a degraded sample, and I think everybody agree, would agree that it would be, uh, is it degraded? The, the, I'm sorry, this, this particular sample here is actually from the condom, all right? This isn't from the, the uh, this is not from the victim's clothes here, but rather from the condom. And I think it's pretty clear that this sample is degraded. The testing laboratory said that it was not uh, and that that was why they were sure it was a coincidental match. And yet now when you look at that condom sample in the context of the positive controls, there is a statistically significantly greater negative slope for the condom sample than there is for what we all accept are undegraded samples. So at the end of the day, what do we have? The testing laboratory is now faced with saying that it's a coincidence, 
despite the fact that there is an astronomical random match probability, despite the fact that it seems very unlikely that these two samples would have been happened, handled in close proximity, in time and place, and now they show similar levels of degradation. The condom sample seems to be just as degraded as the evidence sample from Jaden Lesky. Well, I suspect at this point you won't be surprised to hear that the laboratory still maintained it was a coincidence, but at this point the coroner concluded his inquest and arrived at his conclusions. And so let me read to you or show to you the, uh, some, some words that come straight from the coroner's report. Um, at the beginning of section 8 of his report, he describes in very short terms what it took me a minute or two to explain to you about the circumstances of the case, but he's essentially saying that uh, during the investigation of Jaden Lesky's death, a DNA profile was generated from some blood that was on his clothing, um, and that that DNA profile was found to match a rape victim from somewhere else in Australia who could have had nothing to do with the crime. So that's just leading up to his conclusion. Here is his actual conclusion. Uh, he, he concludes that the match to the clothing occurred as a result of contamination in the laboratory and it was not an adventitious, or in our terms, coincidental match. In other words, the samples from the two cases were examined by the same scientist within a close time frame. And so despite the lab's uh, protestations that it was a coincidence, uh, the coroner ultimately was convinced that what we had seen in the Jaden Lesky case was again an instance of cross-contamination. The other types of contamination that we've talked about in this particular video have been things like positive results in negative controls or reference samples where there's been some contamination between reference samples. I think what we see here in the Lesky case is an important addition to that type of contamination. What we're seeing in the Lesky case is simply this. Contamination can happen between evidence samples. And consider this. Contamination here happened between evidence samples in different cases, separated in time by a day or two. If that type of contamination can occur, Surely, contamination between evidence samples that are handled at the same time for a single case, surely that type of contamination must be more likely. I think it's important for attorneys, both prosecutors and defense attorneys who are interested in pursuing justice, to bear in mind that if there's one evidence sample for a case, that they're dealing with where it's unremarkable to find a suspect's DNA, for instance, that that in turn might cause us to have some concerns about how impressed we are about finding the suspect's DNA on some other evidence sample associated with the case. If that type of contamination can occur in the Lesky case, between cases, handled on separate days, surely there's, an, uh, there's at least a real possibility that that type of contamination might occur within a laboratory at, on a single day working on a single case. It's at least a possibility. And in the context of random match probabilities that are described in quintillions and quadrillions, that probability, even if it's very small, is something that might be of some significance and important for both the judges and the attorneys and the jurors to be aware of. All right, if you're curious about the Jaden Lesky case and would like to read more about the coroner's conclusions and the background of the case, again, like all of the rest of the materials for these videos, you can find it in great detail uh, at the bioforensics.com website at this particular address. All right, so let me wrap things up and talk with you now about, if you're an attorney, what sort of things you might want to consider doing when you're starting to prepare for a DNA case. And I'm just going to take you through two slides here with a couple of points that I think apply equally as well for both prosecutors and defense attorneys. All right, so here are things that both a prosecutor and a defense attorney should be bearing in mind when they're preparing a DNA case. All right, 
First, right out of the gate, it's important that attorneys get complete copies of all of the lab reports that were generated for a case, not just the two or three page summary report that the testing laboratory would have generated, but the entirety of all of their reports. And when you're looking at the reports, here are some things that should set off some red flags for you, things that might make you think that this case might have some questions associated with the DNA testing results. If there are techniques that the testing laboratory says that they've used that you're not familiar with and you've watched all of the videos in this series, uh, there's a good chance that the testing laboratory uh, is doing something that might need some extra attention. I'm talking here specifically about things like low copy number testing, or maybe even familial searches or database searching. But if you're not familiar with the techniques, there's a good chance that they need some closer scrutiny. If the report describes the match between a suspect or a victim in an evidence sample using equivocal terms like similar but can't be definitively included or excluded, that is a sign that there's some interesting issues in play with the case that require some additional attention. And often when you find that kind of equivocal language, you'll hear a description of a sample being um, a partial or an incomplete profile, or the match is a partial or an incomplete match. When the key samples for a case involve mixtures. Bear in mind that those are often subject to alternative interpretations that have detrimental effects on the weight of the, st of the statistics that get attached to the DNA profile matches. And then, if nothing else, you find that there are very unimpressive statistics, one in 50, one in 500, one in 10,000. When you're expecting to see numbers in the quintillions and quadrillions, that too is a sign that maybe this is a case where some special attention needs to be given to the DNA test results. Uh, within the United States, you shouldn't have to worry about this last bit here, about there being no statistical weight. There's an abundance of court cases that establish that in the absence of a statistical weight, DNA test results within the United States are not admissible as evidence. However, in the United Kingdom, this is actually still a matter of some dispute. Uh, and there have been laboratories that have uh, said that they should be allowed to present DNA test results that say an individual is included as a possible contributor and yet not say how impressed the jurors should be by that finding. One last slide of what needs to be done by attorneys preparing for a DNA case. Um, here are some things that should be coming up during the course of initial discovery. Both the prosecutor and the defense attorneys need to be completely aware of the history of the samples from the collection of the samples to the time at which they were tested to where they are now that the testing has been complete. The essence of the reason for that is that we need to bear in mind that these DNA tests are extremely sensitive and that makes them subject to the possibility of contamination. Um, if you take a close look at the history of the samples as they were tested, including the reference samples, you may find that you can un uncover some opportunities where contamination may have occurred. That's something both the prosecutor and a defense attorney would probably be very interested in knowing before the issue were to come up in trial. Um, as part of that discovery material, both the prosecutor and the defense attorney need to look carefully at the entirety of the laboratory's notes. If you've watched other videos in this series, you'll see that analysts will often write down information that biases them and uh, may not be necessary for them to have in hand, and that sort of thing would come to light from a review of those laboratory notes or their bench notes. And I want to linger on this next idea here about electronic data a little bit. All of the data that gets generated during the course of DNA testing gets captured by a computer. And then that, in turn, gets used to generate those graphs, those electropherograms. There are no DNA analysts who feel comfortable with interpreting test results simply on the basis of another laboratory's table of alleles. 
or even by looking just at printouts of another laboratory's electropherograms. To really understand what's going on with testing results, DNA analysts want, they need to roll up their sleeves and look at the underlying electronic data, analyze it the same way that the original testing laboratory did. It's necessary for DNA analysts to have access to that electronic data. The American Bar Association has discovery guidelines that are consistent with that, that say that in DNA tests, the electronic data must be provided. It typically comes on a CD. It's that volume of information. There are some laboratories within the United States that seem to be resistant on occasion to providing that electronic data. There is no good justification for that. That's not the way that science is done. Scientists should be able to look at each other's data and ultimately arrive at the same conclusion. You can't uh, say that this is science if scientists aren't able to look at the data that underlies DNA test results. Then, other discovery matters that attorneys should be interested in. It's going to be important for both the prosecutors and the defense attorneys to be aware of the credentials of the analysts, both uh, for the prosecution and the defense, and if there are any proficiency tests that those analysts have been involved with, how they've done on those. And I think last but not least, uh, as this particular video hopefully makes the point, uh, it's very helpful, very important for both prosecutors and defense attorneys to be familiar with a testing laboratory's unexpected results logs. Uh, prosecutors need to know what sorts of problems might arise with testing so they know which samples may be most at risk and most vulnerable to assertions about problems and defense attorneys need to know full well what sort of problems might be arising within a particular testing laboratory. All right, and at the end of the day, uh, there's nothing wrong with both a prosecutor and a defense attorney getting some help um, and talking with somebody who has some experience and looking at those types of materials, the electronic data, the bench notes, the unexpected results log. Um, attorneys have to deal with so many different kinds of, of evidence during the course of their careers. It's hard to be on top of your game for every last bit. There are people who are professionals, who are experts, and should be able to help talk you through those types of problems if you think that they're pertaining to a particular case you're involved with. So, when all is said and done, um, what we have here then is, once again, this idea that there is some extremely impressive science that underlies forensic DNA profiling between the molecular biology and the population genetics that come to bear, uh, we can generate some incredibly probative evidence from unimaginably small amounts of starting material. But it's important to bear in mind that there are many things that get rolled in together with the idea of the impressive science of DNA profiling that actually aren't that scientific things like examiner bias, but also things like uh, human errors that arise from mislabeling or misplacing tubes. What we need to do is figure out ways to move things from that not scientific category and get them more and more in keeping with the robust scientific aspects of DNA testing. And the concerns that arise with DNA tests are often at their greatest when we're talking about samples that involve small amounts of starting material or mixtures or where analysts have had to use their, their training and experience to resolve ambiguities. Those are almost invariably associated with issues that are uh, important for a jury and a judge to hear when they're evaluating DNA test results. And that concludes this video on what sorts of things might go wrong during the course of forensic DNA testing. Again, uh, all the slides that have been associated with this talk are available at bioforensics.com. And I hope that uh, you've found this video helpful and that if you haven't already, that you'll take a look at the other videos in this series. Thanks very much.